Uh, so can we welcome our next speaker on stage? He is uh, a veteran of ETT events, I gather. He's been he's spoken at RubyConf uh, twice already. Uh, he's from uh, Singapore, and his name is Saushan. Did I get that right, or did I mangle it again? I apologize. I am so bad with names. Uh, so he is the director of the uh, Global Consumer Engineering uh, arm of PayPal and is here to talk about programming complexity. Uh, he's got almost 20 years of, uh, uh, of mostly web dev, done a bunch of languages. He's a published author, three books out, one more on its way. And uh, uh, well, let's, let's get started. Welcome. Can we have a hand, please? Hello. Hello. I have no idea where, oh yeah, it's on, right, great. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Sao Xiong, and I guess I'm kind of nervous now. I haven't done this for close to a year. You know. I have been speaking in India a um, couple of times. I spoke twice in the RubyConf India in Pune, so I am kind of familiar, but you know, every time I come up here, it's like stomach churning. And, and everything. So um, I'm going to talk about programming complexity today. So ironic, we don't talk about code complexity, and I do a follow-up on programming complexity. Um, modeling complex systems with Go and React. So um, React is kind of incidental, so um, it's something that I just took up to play around with. Really, the, the main part of it is in Go. Um, but let me just do a quick start and uh, do an introduction about myself. Um, I come from Singapore. Uh, and this is a picture of Singapore I could find last night. I was spending a lot of time tweaking on my slides last night, actually. Um, I work for PayPal, uh, based in Singapore. And I've done a number of years in, uh, of Ruby. I've actually, I've, I did a count. Last year was my 10th year doing Ruby. Uh, I guess this is my 11th year. I've uh, done a few books on Ruby. And the last one is the one that I was most proud of. And I think about two years ago, I started picking up Go. So uh, actually, I picked up Go a number of years back, but I think it was before 1.0. I looked at it and said, OK, I have no idea what to do with this. And then I just put it aside. And a couple of years ago, I came back and said, wow, there are just so many things here. And I started fiddling around with it and playing around with it. And, and I actually grew to like it quite a bit. And uh, somehow or another, it sort of grew into, well, basically what I'm doing today. Um, and of course, a little bit of uh, self-promo here as well. This is the book that I'm, I'm writing. Yeah. It has been going on for a year plus. Um, I hope it's going to come out within the next two weeks uh, with Go 1.6. Otherwise, it will have to be Go 1.7. <laughs> and I'll keep revising it. Anyway, um, the topic that I want to talk about today is complexity. Uh, so this is, there's actually no particular definition about what complexity is. I've rediscovered the entire internet, Google everywhere I can find. No definition, so I made up my own. Right? Uh, it's a, a behavior that emerges from a group of interacting parts, so a number of parts that is different from what is you can see directly from the result of interactions between the uh, uh, individual parts. So if you look at individual parts and see how they interact, um, the behavior does not reflect the individual parts at all. So it's kind of hard to explain with just words. So um, one popular way of explaining it is using flocking birds. Right? The individual birds would follow particular simple rules. They would just follow the, the bird in front of it and try not to smash into him and generally follow the, club, uh, the crowd. And you get flocking birds the same way with um, fishes. Right? So um, it actually has certain behavior that you cannot normally detect from how a bird would move or how a fish would move but the end result is actually something completely different. Right, so that's a little bit on complexity. I am not going to talk about um, birds and fishes today. Uh, rather, I'm going to talk about uh, modeling cultural interactions. So a quick funny pick in case you... <laughs> okay. So it's culturally, culturally apt. Yeah. I see some people not laughing, so I suppose you don't quite get it. But never mind. Um, so, what I'm going to talk about is um, how cultures interact with each other and the results of uh, the culture interacting with each other. So, some examples. Um, have any one of you been to Disneyland? 
in Japan. Anyone at all? It is one of the weirdest experiences I ever had to hear <laughs> Mickey Mouse speaking in Japanese uh, <laughs> and Donald Duck quacking in Japanese. It's like, whatever. Uh, um, <laughs> Starbucks in China. Like, Chinese food in America is not really Chinese food. I tasted it. It is not Chinese food. Um, yoga. Uh, right. And of course, this is something that's totally unrecognizable. Right? A picture I found is supposed to be pizza. Right? You show it to any Italian, he will probably swear at you. Right? <laughs> um, so, cultures do interact with each other, and the resultant is sometimes quite different from uh, uh, what you expect it to be. And the interaction is actually pretty complex, um, and it's kind of hard to actually predict and uh, sort of uh, analyze. But someone actually did analyze it. Um, so this gentleman here, Robert Axelrod, Exer he wrote in 1997 a, quite a seminal um, piece of paper called Dissemination of Culture. Uh, Robert Axelrod is a, an American political scientist. He's a complexity theory researcher, and he is also a National Medal of Science laureate. Um, did a great number of papers, um, amazing papers. If you can have some time, you have nothing to do in your flights or something, I think this is a great paper to read. So what he did was he modeled um, how cultures interact with each other, and basically he came up with a couple of very simple rules, really. The first rule is that cultures that are similar to each other are very likely to interact. And, um, well, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, when the cultures interact, then they become uh, more alike each other. Right? So he, he later on did a sort of a, a mind experiment, and actually did more than mind experiment. He actually did a, a model of it, which is kind of different from what I'm going to do today. Uh, and I'll explain how I actually do it in, in Go. So what I'm going to do is an agent-based model, where every agent represents a culture. Culture here means it's, a, uh, it's actually a set of features. And what features are uh, basically things like uh, you know, language, religion, how you dress, what kind of food you eat, is it spicy or not spicy, uh, do you drink alcohol, you're not, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and traits are the possible values of a feature. Right? So this is uh, the model that I'm using. I will do a simulation on a grid of 36 by 36 cells. Um, each cell having a culture. So basically, a culture would actually reside in each of the cell. Um, each culture has six features, zero to five. And each feature has 16 possible traits. So I guess there's a room of computer scientists. Do you know what comes next? Any? Right. So um, I chose six features and 16 traits precisely because I want to fit into the color scheme, right? So I use hex color codes, um, so red, green, and blue, and uh, 0 to 16, 0 to 15. Each culture has eight neighbors, and they will interact with these eight neighbors, and then there will be a result of that interaction. And this is the algorithm. So at every tick of the simulation, I will randomly pick n number of cells, and I will compare the features of the culture with each of its neighbors. Like if the trait difference from the uh, same feature between the two cultures is less than a certain number, then I will select either culture and copy the trait from the feature, one feature to another. Okay? So these are just words. Let me just uh, illustrate a little bit further. So for example, A and B are neighboring cultures. Um, so culture A has a particular um, well, sequence of numbers, and culture B is the same as well. Every one of these, um, every one of the feature, I will do a comparison. So in this case, a difference between culture A and culture B on uh, a feature two is three. And I would add up all of these differences together to get a number. Right. So if uh, it's completely different, it's like black and white, then the 100% difference will be 96. Um, and if it's exactly the same, the, the difference will be zero. Um, the theory here is that the more similar the cultures are, the more likely they are going to be cultural exchange. So the probability of cultural exchange will be this, right? Um, one minus the difference between the two cultures divided by 96. And so given the example earlier on, that will be 64.6%, right? So 
what I'm trying to say here is there's 64.6% chance that when these two cultures interact with each other, uh, they would actually exchange cultures, right? And by exchanging culture, what I mean is that I would randomly choose to copy one of the uh, culture's uh, feature to another, right? So they would actually adapt each other's culture. This is a very simplistic model, um, but this is a simulation, and let's see what happens. So what do we actually want to measure here? Um, so at every tick, what I want to measure is the average feature distance, and this will tell us how different the cultures are. Um, I also want to measure the uh, number of unique cultures there are in the entire world. Uh, the number of changes tells us how vibrant the uh, cultural changes are. Like the more cultural changes means that it's very vibrant, everyone's interacting with each other. If there's zero culture exchanges, that means uh, it's, it's static, right? Everyone is, will remain where they are for the rest of uh, eternity. Right, so this is it. Uh, I'm going to actually show you a live demo. And um, I just want to explain this a little bit. So it is all in the browser. The browser um, is a web application. So the back-end simulation is done in Go. The front-end is done in, in React. And this basically is a grid using Bootstrap. Um, each one of these is actually a cell. And I will set up the, uh, I will set this thing up, random uh, distribution. Then I'll start the simulation. And then I'll see um, what happens, right? So let me just quickly get on to, to this. Okay. Uh, to this, I'll start the simulation. And I shouldn't show this first. So this is what it is. I set it up, this is random. Right. I'll randomize it again to show you it's truly random. And then let me start the simulation. And let me show you, the, uh, as the simulation goes, this is what happens. The blue is the distance between cultures. It's how alike different cultures are. Uh, red is the number of changes. And uh, the orange is the number of unique cultures. Right. You can see here, the cultures are interacting with each other a lot. And it will go on for a while, actually. Uh, in which, actually, we do have time. So you want to see the end of it, if we have some time. Um, but uh, yeah, so it is, this is what's going to happen. And it will run a while a bit. And you notice the cultures actually do group, right? So the cultures actually do um, group with each other. And you can see here as well that the distance of um, between the cultures actually decrease over time, and the number of unique cultures actually decrease as well, even though the changes don't really decrease as much. Right. So uh, let me get back into the presentation. So the observations from this particular simulation um, eventually, right, as if you play out the, uh, the rest of the simulation, uh, equilibrium will be achieved. But equilibrium means there will only be a few dominant cu cultures. Uh, the dominant cultures will be very different from each other, or can be very different from each other. There would be, uh, if I actually reduce the number of the, the area where it is, the equilibrium will be achieved faster, uh, but the number of dominant cultures will also be smaller. That's actually to be expected. And a culture that is more dominant at one point in time doesn't mean it would be dominant in the end. So you will see that uh, initially there might be a culture that is very dominant, and eventually that, that culture actually totally goes away and there's another culture coming in. So that's, that's quite an interesting observation. So this is a simulation I've done um, on this. And um, to be honest, I thought with 20 minutes I wouldn't have enough time to do more than uh, one of them. I actually prepared three, so I could actually show the other two. And this is what I'll do as well. Um, I need to unhide my slides, though. Just give me a second. Uh, 
very quickly. These are the observations. So the next thing that I, um, I want to model is um, <coughs> racial segregation. Um, I've never stayed in Chicago, but um, apparently in uh, one of a uh, cartographer in 2000 actually charted the uh, population of Chicago, right? Um, and you notice here there is huge difference, um, and each of these colors actually represents one particular uh, race. And you see that um, there is actually a lot of segregation between the different races. Like um, the blacks would be in a particular area, um, the whites would be in another area, and the Asians would be somewhere. I can't see the green here. Uh, and so on and so forth, right? So, very segregated. Right? That's a uh, very interesting and eye-opening uh, kind of revelation from this. From this, and um, basically, a number of cities were actually um, also analyzed, and you can see that from certain cities that uh, they are a lot more extreme. Like Detroit, apparently has a huge center of blue, um, dressed pink. New York as well is quite quite bad. Um, Washington is like almost cut into half. Like one, the east side is blue and uh, west side is uh, uh, is pink. And LA as well. Although LA seems to be a bit more integrated. So from that, it doesn't mean that what what the Americans are very, ra very racist. Uh, actually, no. I actually found this as well. Like in London, um, apparently the, there's actually a lot of segregation of the races. And why does this happen? Is that because humans are inherently Racist, or I, I, is it because the government actually uh, did it this way? They they actually segregated people by by race. I don't really think so. I think there's our general policies of trying to desegregate people. But why? Why does this still happen? So, another very smart guy actually wrote a paper as well. Uh, Thomas Schelling, he's a American economist, and he actually won the Nobel Prize in 2005. Um, he wrote this paper called Dynamic Models of Segregation, which is very interesting. Um, he actually, again, proposed a model of how to um, model segregation. And he did it, of course, in a completely different way. Uh, actually, he used um, coins and a piece of paper. Of course, I'm not going to do coins here. So uh, I did another simulation. Again, with uh, 36 by 36 grid, which each cell with a household, eight neighbors. And uh, the algorithm, the rules, at every tick, I would check every cell. And if there's at least n number of his neighbors out of the same race, it will basically do nothing. It's happy staying where it is. Um, if not, then the household will pick a random cell uh, and move there. And um, the parameters that I can use to sort of uh, play around with is one is n, is an n number of uh, neighbors, number of races on the grid. Um, percentage of vacant cells, because of course, if every cell is occupied, then there's no talk about moving around because you can't move at all, right? Um, so there has to be a certain percentage of vacant cells. Um, policy limitation. So what happens if we impose certain policies to say, look, you cannot move under certain circumstances, right? So you cannot have more than I number of neighbors of the same race. If, like for example, in certain countries, like you stay in this area, you cannot be entirely of the same race. You have to have certain quota of people living there uh, of a particular race. So if we impose this policy, what happens? So um, this is a code. Actually, I was supposed to show you the code just now. I forgot. <laughs> but anyway, this is the code. And uh, let me show you the demo. Um, it's still running, yeah. So here's the demo. Um, in this particular demo, I have a uh, number of neighbors, basically a number of uh, acceptable number of neighbors. So it has to be, you have to have at least two neighbors which are the same race. Otherwise, you will move. 
And then the number of races, there are two, there's just red and blue. Um, it's coincidental, by the way. Yeah, it's not a political statement. Um, number of vac the vacancy cells 20% and the neighbor's quota means 8. Um, so let's do the setup, it's random. And let's do a... So this simulation, as you can see, and it's sort of stabilized now, right? So it's, it's not actually moving anymore. You see there are actually big blobs of... Uh, uh, I mean, there are blobs of different races. So people do segregate. Even though I say, if it's just two neighbors uh, who are of the same race as me, I'll be happy and I wouldn't move. But still, there is segregation. Let's change this a little bit. Let's put to three. Uh, set up again. Again, you see the, the difference here as it actually stabilizes. Um, Previously, you see that is it is segregated, but it is kind of scattered. Um, but if you see this, mo this this simulation now, with just an increase of one, with the mentality of everyone is that I need to have at least three of my neighbors to be of the same race, it is really really segregated. And the se lines of segregation is, is actually a lot. It's, it's very clear. Um, let's just increase to four. and see what happens. It doesn't seem to segregate that well. Um, so, because this is random, the probability of actually segregating is actually random. Um, you will start to see a kind of pattern, right? There's one big blob of red and one big blob of blue. Um, and the rest of it, it seems to be just r randomly moving around. And the reason is very simple, is because um, the percentage of the vacancy, there's um, 20%. There just isn't enough space for people to move around, so we're going to keep moving. Right? So it is actually not a stable state. Although, um, depending on the chances, uh, eventually it would actually stabilize into just two big blobs. So again, this... Um, and it doesn't really matter the number of um, races, right? Let's say I increase it to num four races. Let's go back to three. And set it up again. And you see, eventually, um, there would be segregation. Although, because it's a smaller grid, then uh, uh, it takes a while for it to actually come to a stable state. Right, let me get back to my slides. I think uh, running a bit out of time. Okay. So this is the demo I showed you early on. And observations. So, um, first thing is that segregation do happen, even though there's weak preference or neighbors at the same time. Um, the weaker the preference, the less segregated. So up to a certain level, if you say if people are a lot tolerant, then there'll be a lot less segregation. That's to be expected. Uh, the stronger the preference, the more segregated, again, to be expected. But surprisingly, this threshold is actually pretty, pretty low. Um, and at a threshold, stronger preferences results in an unstable state and a non-segregated state. So this means really the occupants of those cells keep moving around. Um, number of races actually have no impact at all to segregation, so you can have as many as you want, uh, there will still be segregation. Number of cells also have no impact. I didn't really show this, but you can take my code and play around with it. And finally, again, this is something I have not uh, uh, shown as well. So policy enforcement actually has very limited impact on segregation. So for policy uh, makers, for example, if um, say you want to say, look, what happens if I impose a particular policy? How is it going to impact? I think doing simulations is one possible way of doing this. But then again, um, these are all simulations, right? So uh, these are all really uh, not very... Um, yes, yeah, they are not absolute numbers. Right? So that's um, my presentation today. Uh, these are my details. If you want to talk more about it, you can come and talk to me. Thank you. Questions? Uh, we... we uh, we have time for maybe exactly one question, and we'll have to take the rest offline. So can we have just one question, please? Uh, in the yes. cultural exchange simulation that you had, uh, you said that if uh, you exchange a uh, probability, uh, one of the features uh, between the cultures, if the probability is high, 
between two cultures, if, yes. the, if the difference is uh, not very much, yes. the probability of a c feature exchange taking place is higher. Yes, that's but right. How w when do you actually exchange or like copy over the feature? How do you decide to do that? Oh, so um, it's random. So I randomly generate a number. So you may or may not. You may or may not. So, so there's no like a probability threshold beyond which you decide to copy over. No, no. no. Okay, so yeah. Okay. So of course, if it's hundred percent, then the probability will be hundred percent. Right. Right. But it is random. I generate random numbers to do this. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank Kay. you. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to uh, cut short the Q and A in the interest of time. Uh, but please feel free to, to ask more questions offline. In